They draw us closer to yourself in all that we do as we go into your world, as we celebrate the gift of life in the baby you have blessed us with. Lord, just glorify your name. Glorify your name. Let's sing this. Draw me close to you. together glorify Jesus this morning give him glory give him glory give him praise so Lord draw us nearer to your precious bleeding side and this morning as we go into the word of God we plead the blood of Jesus for access that we will have access to heaven and heaven will have access into our hearts in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. This morning I want to ponder on what it means to love God with all your heart. 
My text is from Matthew chapter 22. You know, last week we looked at Habakkuk, the prophet, who saw his environment, he saw the society, he saw all the things that were going on, and he was asking God questions. Why? Why is there so much injustice? Why is this going on? Why are the wicked not punished? And then God said, come up. Come up, let me show you a vision. Something that cannot fail. Something that will not tarry. Something that will surely come to pass. And after he encountered God, he said, Lord, you know what? Even if the olive tree he is not budding, if, even if there is nothing in these stores, I will still rejoice in the Lord my God because I know that whatever happens, whatever comes or doesn't come, you never change. Amen. Governments will come and go. People will come and die. But God remains ever constant. He is the constant. You can anchor your life. You can depend on him. You can trust him. He never fails. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor you will prevail in this God. You see, the premise of Christianity is that no matter what happens, you win. Now, when, when you understand what it means to be a Christian, it means, it means even when it's like it is dead and buried and stinking and in the grave three days, what happens? Ooh, it will rise again. Ha hallelujah. Tell somebody nothing dies in your life. No dream dies. No inspiration can die. Because the nature of God is restoration. That's the nature of God. That's the first thing we saw in the Bible. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. And then it was void and without form. And then what happened? God said, if you can get the word of God into that situation, there will be resurrection. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor from now, nothing dies around you. Amen. And so the context of Matthew chapter 22, we saw Jesus answering questions from very hostile religious people. They were asking him all manner of things, asking him about the resurrection, asking him about marriage. Praise God. And he, he, he humbled himself and, and kept answering them. And then the law of Moses, he summarized the entire law in just a few sentences. Let's open to Matthew chapter 22. Hallelujah. Last month we had 21 days of prayer and fasting because God said we should seek him. But this month we are having 31 days of adoration. Amen. 31 days of adoration. And um, what I'm going to read now is a summary of our destiny. This is our destiny. This is the purpose of God. God has a purpose on earth. He loved the world so much he sent his only begotten son to die for us. Amen. That we should not see eternal death, but we should enter eternal life. Why? That's the big question you should ask. Why? Why did God pay that kind of sacrifice? Why did he do all that for you and I? It was so that we can live a life that adores him. We can live a life that worships him. That is, the, that is what God wants from you and I. Hallelujah. And so every revelation of heaven in the Bible is one of worship. It's one where angels are adoring him. Elders are bowing down. Everybody is casting down their crown. Because that is the only thing God cannot do for himself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so it's a practice. It's a lifestyle. It's something that becomes the life we live. That is the life we are destined. That's our destiny. Once you deviate from that, things will start getting difficult. 
Because God inhabits the praises of his people. Moses had that understanding. He said, you know, if you are not going with us, don't, don't, <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. Don't take us from here if you won't go with us. And throughout the march in the wilderness, Judah went first. Praise had to go first. And so it's important to understand these principles. God is a God of principles. If you get the principles, you get God. Amen. A man, God sent to Hezekiah, said, as I tell him he's going to die. And then Hezekiah said, okay, no problem. So if I die, who will be praising you the way I praise you? You, you, know, you know we have that thing. You know we have that thing. Who will be doing that? Do you think there's another person? <laughs> I'm putting my own dramatization to it now. Do you think there's somebody who will praise you the way I've been praising you? God said, okay. <laughs> God, I changed my mind. Hallelujah. Praise can make God change his mind. Hallelujah. Praise can redress, redraft, restore your destiny when we understand it. And when it is sincere from the heart. It's not singing. Amen. Hallelujah. It's not just singing. It is connecting with the heart of God. The heart of God is a heart of love. The heart of God is a heart of love. The depth of God is the depth of love. And that love, God wants to lavish it on you. Amen. And so, for a Christian, really, our destiny is, first of all, understanding the depth of God's love. And then growing in a capacity to carry that love. So, when you look at the entirety of the Christian life, the new creation, let me call, let me say not Christian, the new creation. The new creation was created by God to carry God's love and to demonstrate God's love. And so God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son to bring about a new creation, but that new creation is an extension of God who is love. And so as a new creation, if you don't begin to grow in an understanding of how much God loves you, the depth of God's love, and it is endless. It is just unimaginable how much God loves you. When you begin to realize this love and the dimensions of what God can, will do for you, because he said if he gave his only begotten son, how much more will he not also freely? He's not asking to pay any cost. Freely give you all things. When you begin to grasp it, when the Holy Spirit begins to give you an understanding, the greatest prayer you will pray in life is, Lord, enlarge my capacity. Lord, what? Because you will realize my brain is too small, my physical attributes is too weak. Amen. Enlarge my capacity to love. Listen. Your capacity to love defines your inheritance in God. You cannot, you cannot have access in God to what God has prepared for you, for your inheritance beyond your capacity to love. And so even faith, you can't please God without faith, but he said, you know, if you stand praying, forgive. That's an aspect of love. Amen. Praise God. And so they came to Jesus in the Hebrew, in the, in the, in the Judaic um, laws. There are 613 laws. And some are called major laws, some are called lesser laws. So, so they came to Jesus with a, a kind of a, a trick, a trap question. And they said, so what is the most important of the laws? Amen. 
He wanted him to pick one and then they challenge him and say, what about this one? Praise God. But we see how Jesus answered them. Matthew 22, Jesus said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. All your heart. Amen. With all your soul. With all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments rest all the law and the prophets. Praise God. Hallelujah. So the ultimate key to fulfillment in life, brethren, I want you to get this. The ultimate key to fulfillment in life is understanding the love heart of God and returning to it. Amen. I told the men, you know, I can't remember whether it's on Father's Day or not. I said, I said, you know, it is such a privilege to be a father, to have a child. You know, you know, sometimes, sometimes we, we, we really don't get it. Because that, that is an awesome share with God. A child that begins to grow, the first God that child knows is the father. So if you misrepresent God to that child by misbehaving, by treating the mother and anyhow, by, by, by just whatever you do, some people find it difficult to look up and say, Father, because the first thing that flashes in their mind is their father who comes home drunk and is doing all manner of misbehaviors. And so, and so they, they, even though they are saved, they've given their life to Jesus. But there's still something that draws them back. They cannot fully enter the love of God. They cannot comprehend that a father can love me, ready to die for me. They, they can't see it because their consciousness and they are growing up and all they have known is a father who was responsible. No man will be like that here. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. It's just not possible. You can't be in our midst, amen, and not change. <laughs> Praise God. And so the, the, the most important thing is to understand the depth of God's love and to begin to respond, respond to, the, to it. And because there is... There is something we can't find anywhere else, not with anyone, not with any interest, not with any other object of desire in this world. Nothing compares to God. Hallelujah. Nothing, absolutely nothing compares to God. And it's a personal thing. It's so personal. It's so, so personal. You know, Within every body of Christ, in our church now, in our fellowship, there's a weight of glory. There's a corporate grace. There's a corporate anointing. There's a weight of glory. Amen. And we build up to that individually. As we grow and we mature in our journey, there's a weight of glory. There's a weight here. There's a spirit here. There's an anointing here. Praise God. But... That will never supersede your, in, your individual work with God. If you look at Acts chapter 3, for instance, I'll just, I'll just tease you with this. When, they, when Peter and John went into the, uh, the synagogue or whatever, and they met this man at the gate beautiful, the man who had been uh, lame all his life, praise God, Peter said, look on us. Look on us. But then he stepped forward and said, such as I have. It's, not such, it's, not, it's never such as we have. Amen? He said, such as I have. So within us, each one still defines their work with God. Each one. Each, ah, 
He said, look on us, but such as I have. I have found many Christians, and I laugh. Every denomination, ah, I, I'm, I, am, I go to, <laughs> I go to, as if when you get to heaven, God will say, which, which church are you attending? It has no relevance. It has no relevance. There is an us fellowship. Oh, we are chapel of light. Hey, chapel, chapel, chapel. Amen. It means nothing if your life, you cannot stand and say, such as I have. It's about Jesus. If you don't have him, your denomination means nothing. Praise God. It's just truth. Amen. You may be angry with it. You may not like it, but it's just the truth. Amen. Peter says, such as I have. John was standing beside him. He didn't say such as we have. Let's, let's join. Prayer of agreement. <laughs> Amen. Such as I have. What do you have in him? What is your passion for him? You know, it's very, it's very, it's very, very personal. It's very personal. The depth you want to get to is personal. You, the passion you want to have is personal. The love you want to demonstrate for him is personal. Hallelujah. This tells us something about God, which is crucial for us to understand. God has one purpose. Formed man from the dust and <sighs> breathed into man <sighs> the breath of life. God still wants you and I to be filled with himself. That first act was to fill man with himself. Jesus came to demonstrate what it means for a man to be filled with God in the bodily form. God has not changed his intention. God has not changed his purpose. That has always been his purpose. That is his purpose forever. That is why we have eternal life when we receive Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So that is God's purpose. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 16. I was reading this this morning. God, our creator, is passionate about this, about we being filled with him. The prophet Hanani went to King Asa and told Asa, he said, you see, now that you are filled with yourself, you stop being filled with God. Because when you are filled with God, you depend on God. You trust God. You consult God. Amen. You don't want to take any step without him. So Hanani told King Asa, he said, now that you are filled with yourself, you are no longer depending on God, he said, you will see wars. And so wars and difficulties and things arise in our lives to the extent that we give up on God. Are you with me? He says, the path of the righteous has a shining light that shines brighter and brighter. And I tell you, there's a place in God where you win all the time. People say, you know, life is up and down. You know, you climb this mountain. As soon as you climb this mountain, there's another mountain to climb. Who told you so? Where did you see that? You know, I, I have found, I, I go to some um, public spaces, and people are praying. I pray, I pray, ah, you will not save this, uh, you, you will not bury your children. Did, did uh, Abraham bury his children? Did Isaac? So which covenant are you? What are you talking about? So people like to pray out of fear. They pray what they are fearing. Instead of praying the promises of God, you have not even touched the promise of God. You are talking about your fear. And we, we, we think that is a Christian prayer. You know, I don't want to make specifics so that people won't say I'm talking about a particular <laughs> denomination. Amen. But that's it's not scriptural. Amen. 
When you are under this covenant, it is under the blessing. The blessing of God. The blessing of God. Amen. They will not have, God said, I will give my angels charge over you. So, so what are you looking, what are you looking around for accident? Eh? I said, you will know that. Said, no, with long life, I will satisfy you. In other words, you have, you have, you have a say. And I'm not satisfied yet. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. I still got some things to do. Amen. They stoned Stephen. He said, Father, I commit myself into your hand. God said, okay, come. They stoned Paul. He said, I'm not going yet. I still got some things to do. Amen. They, the same people stoned the two of them. Praise God. What I'm saying is, please, even when people are praying for you, uh, please note what kind of prayer they are praying. So I don't just bend your head and be people speaking nonsense, you know, speaking. It's just traditional fear. Tradi the traditional way we used to pray. We now bring it into the scriptures, and then we want to also just corner it. It's, not, it's nothing scriptural about those things. Look at how Abraham blessed his children. Look at how Jacob, you know, blessed, you know. Look at the promises. He says, he says, he says, through these exceedingly precious promises, I have made you to be a partaker of divine nature. The promises of God makes you a partaker of God. Amen. And so, what does it mean to us? To live a pure, uninterrupted, committed life, it takes exercise. Eh? It's not beans. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Amen. Ah, it takes, you see, to get saved is easy because you have not done anything. Christ has paid the price. Just lift up your hand. Just say, Lord Jesus, forgive me my sins. I come to you. Lord, I, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Jump, that's it. But I tell you that to, to stay on that path is not, is not as easy. Amen. Praise God. It's not as easy. Why? Because it takes a consistency. It takes a consistency. You can't see somebody who is studying for a degree in the university and who is a serious student playing around. I, am I, are you feeling me? You, you can't see somebody who seriously wants to make a first class just junketing around. No, it's the same way. The Bible says nobody contests in a race except he does it lawfully. And so to love God with all your heart, as the Bible says here, with all your soul, with all your strength, it will take a level of discipline and consistency. Because things will challenge the love of God in your life. Praise God. You develop hunger for what you what you feed on. You develop a hunger for what you are feeding on. And so the way with God is that once I start pressing into God, David said, taste and see. That a lot of, when you taste, you will want more. Hallelujah. But let me, let me tell you, the, the truth is that there will be distractions. I have found, I don't know about anybody else, but in my journey, when I begin to taste, when I begin to enjoy, praise God, there will be moments and days when it's like, today just relax. Ah, did you kill Jesus? Relax, my friend. <laughs> Amen. And, and such times, you must be sensitive that you're already hitting the, the devil, you're hitting him in the nose. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise God. And such times it takes the discipline to say, you know what? No, 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 no. 
okay, maybe this was because I was able to pray one hour in the spirit yesterday. Today I'm going to do it for two hours. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ephesians chapter 5. With all your heart, to love with all your heart means at all times. There are times when God will be quiet. There are times when, you know, God will say no. Amen. Praise God. You know, sometimes God says no. Eh? You know, sometimes God says wait. Sometimes God will just be silent. God won't answer you. Amen. Praise God. But to love him with all your heart means that you have gone beyond whether God does it or he doesn't do it. You are not, the issue is not that God answered my prayer. The issue is not, you know, the, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they say, you know what? Is it God? We won't compromise. Amen. Is it fire? Let's go. <laughs> When we meet him, he will, he will explain to us. Praise God. So to love him with all your heart is to get to that point where you are not pra praising God has become your life, my life. It becomes the life we live. It becomes, it becomes just an expression of ourselves. Amen. As so whether things are good or things are bad, there is only, we only have, the Bible says in the First Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, it says, we have one God, the Father, the source of everything. He is my source, he is my resource, he is everything. Without him, there is nothing else that matters. Hallelujah. And that's what it means to love God with all your heart, to love him with all your mind. In Philippians chapter 4, the Bible tells us, because our mind is the seat of our will, our reasoning. Amen. And there are many times that if we are not careful, we reason God out. We reason God out of the situation. We think our mind goes in, into this, you know, reasoning mode. But God says, come and reason with me. Reason in my word. Look at what I have said. Can you think through? Let's think about it together. And so Philippians gives us, Paul in Philippians gives us the syllabus of the New Testament. Amen? You know every exam has syllabus now. Amen? Open to Philippians chapter 4 and I'll read verse 8. Hallelujah. Paul said, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, Whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Meditate on these things. Fill your heart, meditate on these things. Look at how he, he, he put the same thing to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 5. And I'm going to close here. Because Ephesians chapter 5, Paul told them in verse 17, he said, don't be unwise. In other words, anything contrary to what he was about to say is foolishness. He said, don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't be unwise. Don't be unwise. When you focus on just your own thinking, you may end up being foolish. He said, don't be unwise. You can keep walking in the perfect will of God. You can live an entire life, 120 years old, and walk in the will of God. How do you do that? Amen. How do you do that? How do you do that? Because it's possible. How do you do that? Listen to what he says. Don't be drunk with wine. Why do people get drunk with wine? Some people say, you know, I need, I need to just relieve stress. This stress is too much. You know, I need to, you know, just knock myself out you know, and all those things. Praise God. 
People give a lot of reasons why they do a lot of things. But Paul here says, don't be drunk with wine. Don't look, look for a stimulant. Hallelujah. He says, be filled with the Spirit. How? He says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to God, giving thanks always. This is the only way to stay in the secret place. He that abides in the secret place of the Almighty shall what? He that dwells in the secret place of the Almighty shall what? Abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say, this is my God in him I have breath. The only way to, to live in that secret place where God is the one going in front of you. He's the one coming behind you. You know when you look at the, when you look at the, when you look at the, um, the Amory, the in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, what do we call it now? The, put on the whole armor of God. There is no for the back. Amen? There is no for the back. Hallelujah. But when you live a life that understands this, speaking to yourself, that is even in the challenges, amen, praise God, you have, there is something you are praising God for. There is something you are dancing about. There's, you know, it is unnatural. It is unnatural to have a difficulty and be praising. It is unnatural, but you are not meant to live a natural life. He says, signs and wonders shall follow you. The signs and the wonders that follow you is a function of the sound you are making. If you are making the sound in the psalm, if you are making the sound in thanksgiving, if you are making the sound, the signs must follow. Amen. The answer must come. It never fails. It has never failed and will never fail. If you believe, let there be light, and there was light, then I want you to know, you have the same spirit of God. Hallelujah. 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 Rise up to your feet. I'm going to round up here. Hallelujah. It says to us, do not be conformed to this world. I, you know, look, it's an exercise. Amen? Praise God. Praise God. How many people go to the gym here? How many people go to the gym here? Hallelujah. <laughs> some of my guys just look like this. Oh, pastor. Oh, I haven't been for some time. Amen. But uh, godliness is exercised. Every opportunity you have is an opportunity to build. Amen. Every time you face a temptation and you resist it, you develop your muscles in that area. Amen. Every time you can look, but you refuse to look, you develop, you, you build up resistance. Hallelujah. Every time you are able to overcome a temptation, it, it looks little. But in that area, you develop, you, your, your capacity increases. And that's how it works. So godliness is exercise. Look for every opportunity, exercise it. Hallelujah. And that is how we grow. Amen. Amen. Lift up your hands. Let's worship God. You know, we, we began with worshiping God. Amen. Hallelujah. I will not stop worshiping God. I just want to be where you are. Dwelling daily in your prayer. Choir, help me before we go to God. I don't want to worship from afar. 